All right, welcome everyone to this edition of the Verifiability Talk. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Gunel Jahangirova. Um, Gunel got her first degree from Baku State University and also a master's from there, but then he moved out, uh, he moved on to the University of Manchester uh, and then to UCL and Fundazione Bruno Kessler, uh, where he got uh, his PhD uh, with very good people, with uh, David Clark, Mark Harmon, and uh, Paolo Tonella, if I remember well. Uh, then uh, he moved on, on to, uh, to Lugano, which is also a very interesting place where she currently is. Uh, and um, I'm also honored to have her uh, very soon as our colleague here at King's College London. And she will be working with us uh, on the verifiability note on the challenge of um, testing AI, particularly on um, ethical aspects of the AI. So uh, without further ado, I. Uh, give the floor to uh, Gunnell. This meeting is being recorded and it will be posted later on on YouTube. If you don't want to appear in the uh, YouTube posting, uh, YouTube uh, recording, you may join us as a guest. Thank you very much, Gunnell, for having accepted our invitation and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. So today's talk is going to be about mutation testing of deep learning system. Uh, but uh, so what I will talk about is um, different works that we have done to be able to adapt the notion of mutation testing to deep learning systems. Here I like, will provide just a brief overview of different steps, and then I will move on into the uh, application of mutation testing to generation of oracles for autonomous vehicles. So here I will talk about this one uh, in more detail. So when did was this distribution? Because the verifiability node uh, focuses on trustworthy autonomous systems, so I thought that this would make uh, the talk more uh, relevant. Apologies, so, I think there is a hand, yes. uh, there is a hand up. Uh, Le Leandro, um, would you like to say something? Or? No, I'm very sorry, Hugo, for my, my mistake. Please That's go fine. ahead. That's fine, not a problem. Okay, so uh, uh, this work is done as part of the ERC Advanced Grant Project Pre-Crime, and it's done in collaboration with uh, my colleagues here at Università della Sicilia Italiana, so uh, with Paolo Tonello, who is a principal investigator of the process, and also uh, Nargis Umbatova, who is a PhD student in our group, has been involved in many aspects of this work, and also my other colleagues, they were involved in different parts of it, so here's the acknowledgement from them. And uh, let's go on with the topic of the talk. So in traditional software testing, mutation testing is an approach where we have an original program, which does some sort of a calculation in, in this example. And then uh, we take it and we apply small syntactic changes to it. So we can change plus to minus uh, three to four, uh, mode of division to multiplication, and we obtain this set of programs with injected holes called mutants. We then take our test suite, we execute it over the original program and over each of the mutants, and we see whether in this test suite we have at least one test case that passes for the original program but fails for a given mutant. If this is the case, we say that the mutant is killed, but if we don't have a, such a test case, we say that the mutant is not killed. And the ratio of killed mutants to the overall number of mutants serves as an indicator of the quality of the test suite, because we assume that if a test suite is able to detect the small faults, then it would be able to also detect the real faults that can uh, take place during the development of this software. So mutation testing is a popular uh, topic when it comes to the research in software testing, and it has actually many applications. So one of them is the one I've already mentioned. It serves as an efficacy criteria for uh, test suites. But it's also used to generate test cases, such that when we generate new test cases, we select them based on the number of mutants that they kill. And following the same logic, they are used for test case prioritization, because if we want to execute only a subset of mutants, we keep the ones that kill the most mutants. Then they serve also uh, as uh, for test oracle assessment and generation, here again, we aim for oracles that are able to detect as many faults as possible. And lastly, it's quite uh, used in the research for fault localization. Uh, given all these applications, there are also the challenges come, that come with mutation testing, one of them being the problem of equivalent mutants, when we have changed the problem syntactically, but semantically it's not changed. 
So this equivalent mutants give us a wrong representation of the mutation score. And lastly, the main challenge associated with it is its high cost because we have to execute our whole test suite on each of the generated. Despite these challenges, uh, mutation testing it, is making its way also into the practical application in big industrial companies, as evidenced by this recent um, uh, publications that describe the application of mutation testing at Google and the possible application of it at Facebook. So given this variety of uh, applications and given its recent success in, be, in being used practically, we started looking into uh, applying the idea of <clears throat> mutation testing to deep learning systems. However, unless traditional software systems, when it comes to deep learning systems, their um, decision logic is not encoded only into their source code. It comes from a lot of different companies, uh, components, uh, which include training data that we use, this model structure and hyperparameters. And once we have an already trained model, the weights and biases of that model. So applying these uh, notions of mutation testing, well-known ones such as mutation killing, equivalence, and etc., is not straightforward. So when we started looking into this idea, there were two works uh, that were proposing mutation operators that are specific to deep learning systems. One of them was uh, named mutation, and the other was in UNN. So if we look at the operators in these two works, they, they, we have 19 mutation operators proposed, and they can be divided into two groups. The first group is our pre-training operators. So basically, as the name suggests, here we introduce the change into the system before we train the model. So one example of such operator is label error. So let's say we have a deep learning system and its training data consists of just four elements. What this operator would do is pick one of the training elements and change its label to something wrong and then retrain the model. Similarly, another operator is remove data where it will remove part of the training data and retrain the system with this reduced training set. Uh, the second group of operators are post-training operators. And what they mostly do is they change weights of an already trained model. And this is why it's called post-training. So um, for example, if we have a weight of uh, 0.5 here, it will change it to 0.75. There are also operators that can be applied both before training and after. And they are mostly related to the structure of the model, such as we can remove a layer from the model before training or after, or we can add a new layer before or after. So once uh, we had these operators on hand, the first question we had is that, but do we even need deep learning specific mutation operators? Because in the existing works, there was no, there was no empirical evidence that they actually do something that existing out of the shelf mutation testing tools for Python would not be able to do. And we decided to test that first. Uh, so we picked uh, five different deep learning systems. We had two models for an NIST data set, two for Cypher 10, and one model for Udacity self-driving car, where the aim of this model is to predict steering angle from the image of the road and to keep the car in the center of the lane. So we used MutePy, which is a mutation testing tool for Python. It has 27 mutation operators and it, it generated 389 mutants uh, overall for our five subject systems. And so when we started to analyze these mutation operators, uh, these mutants qualitatively, we could see that for 68 of them, uh, the mutants, the, the introduced change just prevents training process. So what it would do is that it would remove statements. So the mutation operator is a remove statement, and it will remove statements like model.fit or model.compile. So the training would not even take place, and we would not have a faulty model at, at the end of this process. For 176 of the mutants, uh, the introduced changes were uh, causing failures at the runtime. Uh, for example, uh, let's say we have a deep learning model and it has an optimizer named Adam, uh, the mutation operator changes the string to something uh, else randomly. And if you change the optimizer name to some string that is not an optimizer name, you would not be able to, to run your code. So this is this group. And then we had 145 for which we were able to actually run the code. But when we looked 
into them. 95 of them were producing equivalent mutants, meaning that the change that was made, for example, it would change epochs from 100 to 99. It, we, we would still have a model that behaves like the, our original model. Uh, the, so out of 389, only 50 uh, were mutants that were useful for the purposes of mutation testing, which accounts for only 13% of overall generated mutants. And if we look at them, they were, uh, uh, for example, removing, again, a statement. And if that statement is adding a layer, we would remove a layer from the model, they would change some integers. And if we are normalizing data uh, with some numbers, those numbers get changed. So as a result, we have a different data normalization or we have hyperparameters, learning rate, batch size, which are numbers and the mutation operator would change one number to another. And as a result, we will have change in hyperparameters. So overall, the generated mutants with a, with a tool that is not is not made specifically for deep learning systems was producing a very small fraction of useful mutants. So at this point, we were convinced that we need deep learning specific mutation operators, and we proceeded with analyzing them empirically. So once we started doing that, we very quickly realized that mutation operators for deep learning systems are actually parameterized because if you want to remove data, how much of it should you remove or which data specifically? If you are removing a layer from the model structure, which layer should you remove? So in our analysis, we try to be as exhaustive as possible. Uh, so we used uh, parameters, different ones. So for this one, it would be the percentage of affected data. And we try to use a lot of different values. When it was about layers, we would go exhaustive. So as a result, uh, for these uh, five deep learning subjects, we generated around 16,000 pre-training mutants and 7,500 post-training mutants. So uh, a while that analysis gave us uh, information about which parameters work well for which operator and et cetera. I will not uh, go into details of that. What I would like to talk about is the challenges that we encountered about the application of deep learning, uh, about application of mutation testing to deep learning when doing that empirical evaluation. The first one is definition of mutation killing for deep learning systems. So uh, as I mentioned before, when it comes to traditional systems, we say that the mutant is killed if we have a test case that fails for the mutant. For traditional software systems, that's, uh, for deep learning systems, that's not straightforward to uh, apply because we cannot say that because of single misclassification, the mutation is failing because the deep learning system is not supposed to be perfect and correctly classified all test inputs. And also deep learning systems are stochastic. So the misclassification can be uh, just caused by the retrain. The second problem there is the correspondence to real faults. So the idea of mutation testing is that if you're able to detect the syntactic changes, you, should, you would also be able to detect real faults. So it's very important that mutation operators are designed such that they correspond to real faults. However, in the existing world, this was not the case. The proposed mutation operators were the author's best guess. Of them. The third challenge is supporting test with improvement. So if you have a mutant that your test suite cannot kill, and you know what that mutant exactly does, so for example, it changes minus to plus, this in itself gives you an idea on what kind of test case I should add to my test suite such that I can kill this mutant. When it comes to deep learning systems, they are black box, you change something, you retrain, you don't know what exactly changed and what kind of change you should do in your test suite. So this part is very hard to do manually. And lastly, a high machine cost. As I mentioned before, mutation testing is expensive, but in case of deep learning systems, it comes from the need to retrain for each mutation uh, operator the model. And if your model takes a long time, then this becomes uh, very not feasible. So uh, now I will try to describe briefly how we addressed each of these challenges. And the first one is the definition of mutation killing. So in the works that I've uh, talked, um, the definitions, there are different definitions of mutation killing. Uh, the most uh, common one being the decrease in accuracy. So basically, if your uh, mutant has a lower accuracy than the original, then your mutant is considered killed. 
However, as I said, in deep learning systems, you can have these decreases only because you have retrained. And uh, so, uh, doing uh, this notion of killing only on one single run uh, is not right. So, what we proposed and applied was the statistical definition of mutation killing. And basically, our idea is that you should have end retrainings of your original system, and then you should apply each mutation operator also n times. Then if you, you look into the accuracy or any other performance metric of your system, and you have uh, two vectors of size n, and you decide whether this mutation is killed or not by a given test weight, well, if the difference between these two vectors is statistically significant and the effect size is at least not negligible. Otherwise, you will consider the mutant not killed. So we applied uh, this uh, statistical killing and we com compared it to the threshold-based killing in our five subject systems. Here I will share with you just the visualization of the results for one specific mutation operator applied to cycle 10 data set. So to explain this figure, we consider three different thresholds because what should be your threshold is another important question. So we consider the decrease in accuracy by 1%, by 5%, and by 10%. Then we do 20 retrainings and the outcome of the statistical killing is uh, stable across 20 runs because it's only one outcome for all the 20 runs. But um, for the threshold based, we, however, here we report the proportion for which it was killed according to the threshold based oracle. Uh, and uh, here on the X axis, we have the parameters with which the operator was applied. So for a given label, we would change five uh, five labels to the five percent of the labels to incorrect and up to 100 percent so we can see that uh, for the five and ten percent statistical killing says not killed afterwards it's always says killed and uh, we can see that when it, for example we look at the one percent uh, drop in accuracy that across 20 runs it's not it's killed according to some runs and not killed according to another, and this uh, ratio increases. And once we reach this 85%, when we have a very destructive mutant, it always becomes killed. And the same is true for the 5% threshold. Until this point, it says not killed, but there are um, four parameters for which the outcome across 20 rounds is not consistent. So the threshold-based definition of mutation killing is problematic because it often produces inconsistent results across runs, and also it requires a careful selection of the threshold. And on the contrary, the statistical notion accounts for all available runs that you have, and it does not require to set any drop in the threshold. So once uh, we proposed and uh, sort of empirically showed that the statistical notion of killing is performing better, we moved on to the next problem, which is correspondence to real faults. To be able to judge whether existing mutation operators do correspond to real faults, or to be able to propose the ones that do, one should first understand what actually, what kind of real faults take place in the development scenario of a deep learning system. And that information was not readily available, and we had to work on generating a taxonomy of real faults in deep learning systems. So this study uh, consisted of three parts. And the first one was the analysis of uh, fixed uh, bug uh, report issues reported at, on GitHub and uh, on the analysis of the questions asked by the developers on Stack Overflow. So in this um, two sources of information, you could find uh, like examples of the problem set developers. So we performed a manual analysis of more than 1,000 artifacts. However, even though we got a large list of faults from that, we could see that here we only get the types of faults that can be that are in the source code. And as we know, this, for deep learning systems, this is not the only source of faults. So to complement this information, we conducted a study, a same structured interviews with 20 developers. So we had two interviewers, and the main question of this interview was what kind of fault bugs have you experienced when developing a deep learning system? Once we had the list of faults from these two studies, we performed a further validation study with another set of 21 developers where we provided them the descriptions of faults and asked whether they have experience this fault in their practice. 
So as a result of these three studies, we had uh, this uh, taxonomy of real faults in deep learning systems. So very briefly, you can see that it consists of five main branches, model, GPU usage, API, training, and tensors and input. And if we zoom into any part of it, we can see that there are subgroups. And at the leaf node, we have the exact description of the type of the fault. So once we had a better understanding of what kind of real faults do happen in practice, we started trying to extract mutational characters from them. So we looked at the faults from our taxonomy as well as into other two works that focus on bugs in deep learning systems. And we went one by one through each fault and we tried to come up with a mutation operator that would mimic this exact real fault. As a result of that analysis, we were able to extract 35 mutation operators and we implemented 24 of them into the tool uh, that we have named Deep Crime. So uh, in this table, we have the list of uh, Deep Crime mutation operators. And again, just uh, very briefly, we have different groups. And for example, one is about optimiza optimization functions, and it changes the optimization functions that we have. Uh, another is about training data. This is similar to the ones we've seen before, and it adds noise to training data. The mutation operators are parameterized. So, for example, for this one, you can pass a percentage of training data to which you want to add noise. And we also, for operators, for the parameters of which are in a continuous uh, space, let's say, we have searches that can find the optimal parameters. So we evaluated uh, the mutation operators that we proposed, and uh, we did it on five uh, different systems from different domains. And we showed that uh, none of the operators that we proposed does not generate always equivalent mutants or trivial mutants. And by trivial here, we mean a mutant that uh, causes a change that can be detected by any test suite. We then did the redundancy analysis because we don't want a scenario when two operators have the exact same impact on the model because the time we spent on training the mutants for one of them then wasted and this is also not the case. And lastly, we actually check whether this mutation tool delivers its uh, main functionality, whether it's sensitive to the quality of the test suite. And here we like generate weak test suites and strong ones and we see whether the mutation score is sensitive to this quality of the test. So once uh, we had um, our mutation operators that by design correspond to real faults, we moved on with the support in test suite improvement. So uh, for this, we worked on the approach called DeepMetis. And the idea of DeepMetis is that you have a weak test suite. You know it's weak because you have mutant that this weak test suite cannot kill. You then pass it to DeepMetis, and DeepMetis generates your new inputs with which you augment your test suite, and your test suite becomes strong because now it can kill the mutant. So the idea of DeepMetis briefly, in the heart of it, there is evolutionary algorithm, and it's guided by two fitness functions. The first one is the minimum distance to misbehavior because we want the inputs that are, we want inputs that the, that are misclassified by the mutant. And the second one is the maximum diversity to existing solutions because we want to generate inputs that are different from each other. And uh, with this um, evolutionary algorithm, we were able to generate these uh, test inputs for the implementation. The evaluation of deep methods has taken place on two different subjects with 12 and 10 mutants correspondingly. And first we analyze its efficiency and that it indeed uh, can generate inputs that kill the mutant. Then we compare, compared it to the state-of-the-art tools in the testing for generations of deep learning systems, which are built by the Janus. And lastly, we checked its performance on unseen mutants. So basically, you pass a mutant as a parameter to the deep metis, but we checked what happens if you also, so with the inputs generated for a specific input, uh, for a specific mutant, what happens if we apply those inputs for another mutant. And in our results for 86% of the cases, it's also able to kill the mutant that it has not seen during the generation process. So um, this was about the support in test with improvement. And lastly, uh, I want to talk about the high machine cost, which is uh, an elephant in the room. So um, um, 
we are working on this at the moment. So as I told before, uh, we our definition of mutation score is statistical, so it would require you to do N retraining. So basically, by solving this problem, we made this one more bigger. So at the moment, we are looking empirically into different ways of how we can make this process cheaper. And one approach that we try is reducing the training set such that the overall behavior of the model does not change, but it takes less time to train the mutant. Uh, uh, also, we are looking into reducing the number of epochs, basically predicting at the earlier epochs whether we can the, the behavior of the mutant is different from the behavior of the original model, and etc. So this one is, is a work process. So uh, now uh, I think I can switch to the second uh, part of the talk, which is uh, oracles for autonomous vehicles. So uh, testing of autonomous vehicles aims to ensure that these vehicles are ready to drive the road and keep the people inside them as well as that outside safe. Uh, the research on this subject is quite new and the question on how to assess the quality of driving is uh, definitely an important one to answer. So uh, when it comes uh, to oracles for autonomous vehicles, the leading producers of these cars uh, they report metrics such as the number of miles driven or frequency of human intervention, which are very coarse grained and they are not sufficient to demonstrate the uh, safety of AV. But uh, when we look into academic works, uh, some of them are DNN enabled AVs within simulation platforms, but they only consider violations to the safety requirements, such as off road driving behaviors, as it's demonstrated in these pictures, or collisions with other vehicles, pedestrians, and etc. And while these requirements are indeed vital and they have to be satisfied, using them as oracles uh, lead to having oracles that. Uh, react only to very dramatic scenarios. Uh, other subset of academic works focuses on context and aware threshold as test oracles. So they check, for example, whether the predicted steering angle is different from the ground truth steering angle by, let's say, five degrees. However, there is no comprehensive work that analyzes which set of metrics should be considered and when. Uh, and when generating such oracles, how can we calculate this optimal threshold? And the objective of our work is to provide such a list of metrics as well as an automated approach to calculating the optimal threshold. So we have uh, conducted three different studies uh, for this purpose. Uh, so the first one is a systematic search of the literature. So, uh, as I was saying, the Research on the testing of AVs is a very new area. However, there exists a huge literature in evaluating the quality of human driving under different circumstances, such as when the driver is drunk, sleepy, has specific disease, or is just distracted. And the useful feature of these studies for us was that they always measure the quality of driving using some set of metrics, which we thought might be useful also for oracle generation. So, the second study we conducted was the empirical validation. So uh, the metrics that we extracted as part of the first study, they are used to evaluate driving. However, whether these metrics are applicable in self-driving simulations and correlate with humans' perceived quality of simulated driving needed to be investigated further. And for this purpose, we conducted a human study where we asked the participants to rate the videos of simulated driving, and we investigated whether these ratings correlated with the quality metrics that we have extracted. And lastly, at this point, we had the list of metrics and we needed an approach uh, for the construction of threshold based oracles such that we have a threshold which tells us that the value above this one is unacceptable um, and below is acceptable. So uh, now uh, I will talk about each of these studies in more detail. So for the systematic source of the literature, we started uh, with the database search and our search string uh, combined terms related to the quality of driving as well as the terms that are related to core objects of driving. We then ensured that these publications are in the area of engineering and computer science and that they are papers, uh, journal papers or, or conference papers. So this left us with a list of 2,270 papers and from that we went to abstract analysis. 
So we had inclusion criteria uh, that was that from the abstract, we can see that the driving quality was quantified in some way in this work. And we had exclusion criteria for first was that the vehicle should be a car. We excluded the papers where there was about uh, trains uh, and other non vehicles. Uh, that the metric we are using is um, uh, not related to the human perception system, such as uh, driver's heart rate, eye tracking, comfort, arm stiffness, posture information, brain activity, and etc. And lastly, is that uh, it's not actually related to the parts of the car, such as uh, wheel and etc. So after this uh, manual uh, process, we had 257 papers, and this was a point where we had to go into the papers and extract the metrics that they have used. So we had a pilot study, we had three assessors, and each of them was assigned five papers, uh, and we had two assessors per paper. As per usual, the idea was that we make sure that the assessors understand the task and perform it in a similar way. And then there was the actual study where each assessor had 83 papers and he or she had to go through it and extract the list of metrics that were used. So the metrics that were extracted were grouped into six different categories, lateral position, speed, steering, headway position, braking, and lastly, track. So in the corresponding paper, we have all the list of all the metrics and etc. Here, I will just talk briefly about the one in the group of lateral position. So in each group, we differentiate between metrics and events. So lateral position is a metric, you can measure it, but lane change is an event. Then um, each metric and event can have aggregation functions. Mostly the idea of these functions is to provide one value across a larger time frame. And sometimes the metrics can be also combined. So, for example, this one it would tell you how many times the deviation of target is greater than some parameters. So some of these uh, uh, aggregation functions are also parameterized. So uh, we analyzed... Um, these quality metrics uh, for the Udacity self-driving car. And uh, we design, we used it on three different tracks. So the first one is the lake track and uh, it's a road designed with gentle beds. It has a wide road section and a bridge. And so the street is located on the edge of the lake. So if the car misbehaves, it can fall there. So that's where the name comes from. The jungle track is a challenging road. It has highly narrow curves. And because of these elevation changes, it has a narrow visibility. And the mountain track, it has like one difficult and narrow curve. And it has a, a three lane road section. So we were able to implement 26 metrics that we have uh, extracted from the literature into the Udacity platform, such that when we drive cars in these tracks, we can get uh, all the values of them. Then uh, we proceeded with the human assessment of the driving quality. And for that, we need good driving videos, but we also need the bad driving videos. And this is the point where the mutation testing comes into play because in by injecting mutation, mutation operators, we were able to have driving scenarios which are bad and therefore we could extract the videos. So for each track, we generated four questionnaires such that we can sort of Cover the entirety of the track. And basically, each participant was provided with five good driving videos, five bad driving videos, and one control video. Here, the car would crash. And the idea was that if uh, the human assessed value to this video is not uh, a very low mark, then we know that the questionnaire was not filled carefully, so we could exclude this result. So for each video, we had a five point life scale. So the participants could rate it from very poor to excellent, the quality of the driving that they observed there. And um, we had 63 participants uh, overall. And uh, the, only, the only requirement was that you have a driving license to participate in the study. And we measured the agreement for each questionnaire and for nine out of 12, we had fair agreement, and those were the only ones that we kept. But overall, as we could see that there is sort of a disagreement, large disagreement for other ones, because the quality of driving seems to be a very individual notion, I guess. 
so as a result, we were able to collect um, human scores for 96 different videos, and we checked whether the scores assigned by the humans to these videos were correlating with the values of these 26 quality metrics that were extracted. And we could see that there is correlation for 25 out of 26 metrics. And the highest correlation was for the mean of lane position and for standard deviation of the break. And these results are actually very meaningful for us because basically the idea of this uh, self-driving cars is to keep in the center of the lane. So this metric is very relevant. And as I was saying, uh, we had uh, this jungle track where the, there are high elevations. So managing braking correctly is very important there. So it makes sense that this uh, standard deviation of brake is here. The only metric for which we did not have correlation was maximum of the speed. But that also made sense because the maximum of the speed is a capped uh, value inside the intensity simulator. So then we proceeded with the computation of optimal thresholds. So what we are looking for are oracles of this uh, type. So we have, let's say, n quality metrics. And for each of them, we should find the value of the threshold that uh, decide whether this uh, the value of the metric is acceptable or not. Uh, so the, such oracle, it should return true when the autonomous vehicle is driving well, and it should return false when it's not driving well. So to automatically calculate this threshold, we need, again, an approximation of the faulty behavior. And again, here it comes into play the mutation testing because we use, again, mutants for the approximation of the faulty behaviors. So to better explain the further details of the approach, let's have a look at a small example. Uh, so let's say we have a road and we divide this road into two sectors, X1 and X2. Now let's say we have three quality metrics that we have measured. We have our original model D and we have one mutant M. So we have the values of quality metrics at each sector uh, for both the original and the so if our aim is to generate an oracle that has no false positive, so it always passes for the good behavior, what we should do is to pick the, uh, to pick the maximum value across sectors for each of the metrics. And then we will be able to kill this mutant because uh, the values for the mutant are higher. However, what I described here is a specific uh, scenario of a more generic one. And we can generalize this problem formulation by allowing a fraction of false positives when the original autonomous vehicle is driving. And what we want to do then, we say we have epsilon as a maximum number of false positives that we can have. And the goal of the optimization problem now should be to kill as many mutants as possible. So this formulation, it can be translated into constraints defined in SMT Leaf language, for example, and be solved by an SMT solver. And that would return you the, sorry, that would return you the optimal values for the threshold, given again, the false positive rates that you can accept. So uh, we evaluated this uh, way for generating the thresholds. So what we did is that we used the date to model structure as uh, for the generation, what we did, we generated 50 mutants. We exclude the mutants that lead to crashes because that mutant is obviously killed, so you don't need any sophisticated oracle to kill it. We have only 28 left after that. And then we started with oracle generation. Basically, we considered oracle size from 1 to 10. And by size here, I mean the number of metrics that were included. Then we consider four different false positive ratios. So we allow false positives in 0% of sectors, 3, 7, and 11%. Then we use another model. And here we want to evaluate these generated oracles, whether they can um, detect faults in this driving. Again, we generate mutants, we exclude uh, crash causing ones, and in the end, we have surface rate. So for the Oracle evaluation, what we look into is the false positive rate and the mutation score. So I am not going to present the results for all 40 mutant, uh, sorry, for all 40 oracles that we've generated here. I will just show the most interesting ones. 
So uh, we can see here that if we just use two quality metrics, and we allow no false positives, uh, our oracle is able to kill 48% of the mean. If we allow a small fraction of false positives, as such as 7%, we're already able to kill all mutants with an oracle of size 2. If we switch to a higher size with no false positives, we can kill 64% of mutants. And going further, if we allow seven quality metrics to be involved in our oracle, we can kill 73% of all uh, mutants with no false positives. So we can see that uh, overall, uh, the oracles that we generate have interesting trade-offs between the false positive rate, mutation score, and the size of the oracle. So I think this concludes my talk. So to, I talked today uh, about mutation testing of deep learning systems, in particular, the challenges associated with applying this well-researched uh, approach to testing to deep learning systems. Uh, I talked about our work where we try to extract real faults uh, and build a taxonomy out of it for deep learning systems. Uh, then this was used to, um, to create mutation operators that correspond to real faults. Then I talked about our approach to automatically improve a test suite given a mutant that it's not able to kill. And lastly, I presented the work about the oracles for autonomous vehicles, which uses the mutation testing uh, approaches that I talked about before. And that's it. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have time for questions. Does anyone want to ask any question? I could start with one if no one wants. Uh, Hector, do you want to start? Hi. Yes, sorry, I think I, that's it. Hi, Hi. Bonnet, how are you? Hi, so, thank you. Yeah, my my question is um, so for example in the in the examples of the cars when you were finding a, let's say something that would be related to a mutant that that it was obviously in terms of one of the metrics was obviously uh, killable did mm -hmm. you actually test the mutant and see what was uh, what the car was doing and, and was actually the effect from a semantic point of view okay so we looked into a semantic point of view because as I said, we wanted to exclude the ones that cause crashes uh, because we're not interested in using those. Uh, so mostly what mutants do is that they do not lead to crashes, but they lead to a lot of deviations from the center of the lane. Uh, so this would be a brief summary, but then if uh, maybe, so we didn't do that, but you could maybe cluster them in, in terms of different effect of the quality, of the different effect of the, application of the mutation to different quality metrics. So let's say some change the lane position a lot, some change only small number and things like that. But for example, you might have moments, let's say that your car is supposed to stop in traffic lights or it's okay. not supposed to crash with another car. Did you, did, you, did you see any of the cars doing actually the, the opposite? So for example, from your sensors, did you see that any car was crashing? Okay, yeah, so well, so I, the tracks that I was showing, in all of them, we have rather simple scenarios when there is only one car driving on the lane, trying to keep it in the center, but we do not have complex scenarios that include other vehicles on pedestrians or traffic signs. So that's why we were able to implement only a subset. So the obvious extension of this work is to basically adapt it uh, to do the same. Basically, there's not much to adapt. Just have another simulator that have a more complex scenario and use it there. So then these parameters that you mentioned could be evaluated. That sounds really cool. Probably you can just uh, see how how to adapt it because Carla allows you just automatically to load more more cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So maybe you can just have a look to how to adapt it. Maybe maybe it would be good to put you in doubt with uh, Melan and Majan who are working now on the simulators. Um, yes. So, and just a few minutes ago, they were able to to make it um, to make the autopilot work. So it was it was really sorry auto wear work. So it was okay, really really so, good to see. It. So yeah, you remember when we were talking? I told you that I have like different works that would benefit a lot from more complex uh, scenarios. This, this is one of them. Another idea we have is to basically to see whether the effect of the mutation in simulated driving is similar to the real driving. 
because we would suspect that it, when it comes to real driving, the mutant would really break it. It would not be. It would be hard to have mutants that just affect the driving slightly. So this is another sort of an empirical study that we could do. That's really interesting. Okay, so yeah, that, that was my question. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions? I could ask one. Oh, there is a question already. Jose, please go ahead. Hi. Hi, Gunnar. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very, very nice work. Thanks Thank a lot. Um, so I have a question about the first part of your of your talk. So in the beginning, you said that um, um, developers could potentially, and, and this is one of the one of the main use cases for mutation testing, right? That developers can benefit from uh, these mutants in order to improve their test suites. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, you produce this very nice tool uh, for automated test suite improvement that looks great. My question is, did you have an opportunity to present the mutants that were produced for these deep learning systems to developers to see what their impression was and whether they actually thought that they were uh, worth exploring or worth producing test cases for? OK, so I guess the answer is yes and no. So they were presented to developers as part of the validation study I was talking about. So it was a survey where we were describing each of the faults in fault types in taxonomy, and we would ask if they have um, experienced it in practice or not. Uh, and I think like around uh, half of the developers, no. Uh, I think that developers, if we look like one by one, has experienced at least half of what we presented to them in the survey. Uh, so that was it. Also, uh, the, the taxonomy so it kind of made its way into, into some developer discussions. What we could see from there is that they were agreeing with what it says that, okay, these are really the faults that we have. But in terms of presenting it to developers, and especially in the context of generating test cases, we haven't done that. But that, that would be quite interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose, for the question. Uh, any other questions? So, you know, there have been some work on uh, explaining how uh, neural networks work by identifying neurons that specialize in certain directions, mm -hmm. in, in certain tasks. Would it be an idea to find out those specific tasks and then generate mutation operators that, that work around those, those, those particular neurons and stuff like that? Yes, so yes. Definitely, we could do like more focused mutation uh, generation, let's say. Uh, so I think that would work quite well for the training data operators that we have, where we introduce noise. So when we change the image itself, I think we have only one operator that does that. Uh, and yeah, there we could basically try to change only the pixels that affect the decision and see what happens. Yeah, but possibly also the weights around uh, the, the 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 neuron that is doing a specific task could be. Uh, I mean, for example, suppose yeah. you want to do a mutation that is very specific to say natural language processing, mm -hmm. and if yes. you know which neuron is doing what, probably you could also have a domain specific uh, mutation for for that domain. Yes. yes. Um, about weights. So so far. Because our mutation operators are extracted from real faults, there are no mutation operators that change an already trained model because in development scenario, sort of nobody does that. But yes, if we were looking for a post-training mutation tool and, and how to do that, uh, yes, using explainability could help. Mm -hmm. Because also just changing, because there are a lot of ways changing them randomly is not always leading to a change. That's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, Gia. Hello, Puno. Thanks for the Hi. great talk. Yeah, really great work. Yeah, so so I have a question. So we uh, calculate the mutant killing score, you use accuracy, right? So do you think it might be interesting to check the muta mutation score for other, you know, non-functional properties like fairness, for example? Like we check whether the test suites are sufficient to detect the fairness issues. Yes, so uh, it could be interesting. I think mm -hmm. maybe we should the right way to do that would be to actually first check whether these mutants affect fairness at all, but also try to design mutants specifically targeting fairness. Because right now, I'm not sure 
that that would be the key. you know probably changing training data somehow would lead can lead to to some changes in fairness yeah so yeah, that's definitely something so one more item in our to-do list uh -huh. for <laughs> very good thank you very much all thank you thank you very much again Gunel, for this inspiring talk i guess uh, we have a lot of inspirations for future research from from this talk oh jose you have a, one more question please go ahead just just one out of curiosity um the the the, the definition of this statistical mutation killing uh, hmm? definition uh, i suppose it incurs in an overhead right because you have to apply a mutation operator multiple times as opposed to simply once. Uh, exactly, at, which, yes. at, which, at which point the number of times you apply the mutation operator becomes, let's say, uh, prohibitive? Okay, so um, in all of our, so first of all, yes, it increases cost. Uh, as I mentioned, by self solving the mutation killing problem, we made the cost problem even bigger. Uh, second, uh, Basically, we did we stick to the number of 20 mostly and we did power analysis afterwards. But uh, basically, I think the right point to stop is doing a power analysis and seeing actually if the number of samples that you have leads to a high power. This is something we did. But there are cases when you can get high power if you do 4000 trains, for example, we, we, when you predict sample size, you can see that. So in right now in our like cost reduction work what we try to check whether if let's say we trained five and we try uh, given that information we try to predict the sample size and if it's let's say more than 40 for example or whatever the limit the developer puts we just don't go ahead with that mutation because we're never going to get any result from it uh other than that uh yeah that's the only indicator we, we can have or you just have your budget and we just train as many as feasible it, it, it's, it's, it seems like you, you, you know this work by Goran Petrovic at, at, at Google where they define this idea of productive mutant. It seems as a, exploring that yeah. could be interesting here, right? Yes. Because yes. There, will, there will surely be some categories of mutants and some mutants that will lead to more interesting behaviors that developers want to, to explore. And somehow coming with this prioritization uh, could be very interesting, I think. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Anyone else wants to ask one final question? Anyone else wants to ask a question? Just a couple of more seconds. No, I guess there are no further questions. Uh, if there are no further questions, then thanks again, Gunel, for um, for this great talk. In two weeks, we will have the last edition of uh, the verifiability talk for this academic year, where Jie Zhang, our other new colleague, uh, will uh, join us and we'll talk about testing fairness, if I remember it correctly. Uh, it's, it's about machine learning trustworthiness, so it's more general than only fairness, and we are very much looking forward to that. Please join us in two weeks' time with a talk by Jie Zhang, and thank you, everyone, and see you in two weeks. Bye for now. See you. Bye.